two roads diverge in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair. And having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy, and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, and knowing how way leads on to way. I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee and this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and to be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love. I am my Annabel Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs in heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kingsmen came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, when envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love was stronger by far than love of those who were older than we, and many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of my beautiful Annabel Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so all the night tide, I lay down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life, and my bride 
in her sepulcher. There by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea, Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? And what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? And what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? And what the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp when the stars threw down their spears? And watered heaven with their tears. Did he smile? His work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright In the forest of the night What immortal hand or eye Dare frame thy fearful symmetry? My ears are deaf, and yet I seem to hear sweet nature's music and the songs of man, for I have learned from fancy's artisan how written words can thrill the inner ear, just as they move the heart. And so for me, they also seem to ring out loud and free. In silent study I have learned to tell each secret shade of meaning and to hear a magic harmony at once sincere that somehow notes the tinkle of a bell, the cooing of a dove, the swish of leaves, the raindrops pitter-patter on the eaves, the lover's sigh, and thrumming of guitar, and if I choose, the rustle of a star. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. 
they have their exits and their entrances. And in one man, in his time, plays many parts. His act being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Then the whining schoolboy, with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail, unwillingly to school. Then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress' eyebrow, then a soldier full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth, and then the justice in fair round belly and good cap on lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The six age shifts in the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved a world too wide for his shrunk shank and his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all, that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion sans teeth sans eyes sans taste sans everything To be or not to be? That is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep no more. And by asleep we say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is here to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Ah, there's the rub, for in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns, that patient merit of thy unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would these fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, and that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country, 
for whom's born no traveler returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of thus conscience does make cowards of us all and thus the native hue of resolution is sickled over with the pale cast of thought an enterprise of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action The coming of the end of the spring day is already reflected in the lakes of the cow's great eyes. Bessie Bighead greets them by the name she gave them when they were maidens. Conceived in Milkwood, born in a barn, wrapped in paper left on a doorstep big-hearted and bass voiced she grew in the dark until long dead gomer owen kissed her by the sty when she wasn't looking because he was dared now in the light she'll work sing milk say the cow's sweet names and sleep until the night sucks out her soul and spits it into the sky. It is all at once night now. The windy town is a hill of windows and the lights of the lamps call back the day and the dead that have run away to sea. Blind Captain Cat climbs into his bunk. Like a cat he sees in the dark. Through the voyages of his tears, he sails to see the dead. And Mr. Waldo, drunk in the dusky wood, hugs his lovely Polly Garter under the eyes and the rattling tongues of the neighbors and the birds, and he does not care. But it is not his name that Polly Garter whispers as she lies under the oak and loves him back. <laughs> 